Thank you all for making time to join us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Tim Perrell. I'm the director of the MA program in film and media at JHU. And we are thrilled to be presenting Exploring How Video Games Create Space for Transformation. One of our areas of study is immersive storytelling and emerging technology, which we have branded as ICET. And this piece of our program was founded by Gabo Aurora, who will be in conversation today with Ryan Green. And before I turn it over to them, let me just tell you a little, about e a little bit about each of them. And Gabo, apologies for the abbreviated version of your accomplishments here. I know time is limited. <laughs> Uh, in addition to being the founder of the ISIC program, Gabo has directed and created a wide range of immersive experiences that have been presented at museums and festivals around the world, including Sundance and Venice. And while there are too many experiences to, to go through right now, a couple of the notable ones are The Last Goodbye and These Sleepless Nights, based on Matthew Desmond's book, Evicted. Gabo was also the creative director at the UN and is currently the founder of Lightshed, a storytelling and technology studio. And Ryan Green, who is joining Gabo. Um, thank you, Ryan, for joining us. Uh, Ryan will be teaching a course this fall in the MA program uh, around exploring cinematic gaming. Ryan is a digital interactive artist and game designer. Ryan currently serves as creative director and head of narrative for Numinous Games, a studio he co-founded in 2012. And one of their notable games, That Dragon Cancer, was a BAFTA and Peabody Award winner. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Gabo and Ryan to I'm, I'm very excited to have you here, um, Brian. And, and as you know, <clears throat> at ISET, we really benefit from um, having the best of the best. And you were on the top of our list when we wanted to have this cinematic gaming course that we're developing. And you're just, you know, I think a lot of your work is, is excellent. I think the way I'd want to do this, because, uh, you know, this would be great to do in person. And one day, I hope we can do that. But for now, uh, I've made a set of questions. So this is going to feel a bit formal, but uh, don't, don't let it, don't let it um, take away from, just we're gonna have a conversation as well. So they're more like conversation starters. But you know, at some point, because we want to be mindful of the time, Sure. There's something that might make you um, just transition into another question, perhaps. So, I mean, uh, you know, really what we're here to talk about is the future of the video game medium. Uh, you've alluded to this sort of very, you, know, you put your stake in the ground and said video games are kind of escapism um, or, or a, a hobby or time wastage in some ways. They have this reputation. Um, sure that you address, uh, but you also talk about the transformative power of video games. And this is something that I think I want to be true because of how powerful video right. games are. Yeah. But I also kind of feel, is this a kind of dangerous game to, mm. to revel in a medium that also has extremely extremely troubling culture as well, yeah, yeah. significations, right? But before we go there, um, I think we should just go top level. And here's the first question. Are you ready okay. for it? Sure. Uh, what is your theory or philosophy of, of grief and how did games help that process of grieving? But before that, what is grief in your life? And, what, what does it, what do, what do you think about it? What does it mean? Yeah, yeah. For, for those of you uh, who aren't aware, um, the reason that uh, our, la our first game, That Dragon Cancer, um, got so much attention is because it was a personal retelling of our family's um, battle with cancer. And uh, my third son, Joel, um, who was diagnosed when he was one and ended up passing away when he was five. Um, in the process of loving and losing Joel um, as a game designer, uh, we conceived of art we were going to make in honor of Joel. Um, and we started that process while Joel was still alive. Um, and so the process of creating this game, That Dragon Cancer, was something that was both a, um, an act of journalism of sorts, right? Like uh, this, this sense of maybe creative nonfiction 
It was a, a chance for us to distill everything that was happening to us and put it in a, in a creative form in this world that we were creating. Um, but then it was also an act of mourning. Um, and, uh, you know, after Joel passed away and we were finishing the game. Uh, and so I've kind of seen this, you know, art from both sides. And from, um, and from what I understand about grief and mourning is that grief is the, the internal feeling that you feel um, after having lost somebody. And that mourning is kind of the act. Uh, it, it's something that you do to remember them. Um, and I've also heard it said that, you know, some people run away from grief and mourning. They want to put as much distance as possible. Uh, between them and their loss. And I think in the video game space, certainly that's familiar to people. Like we, es I've heard people say, I escaped my childhood through the act of gameplay or of playing video games. And certainly that's an important and essential part of what video games represent to people. Uh, for me, uh, it became a way of processing and sharing my grief with others. Um, it became uh, an act that allowed people to, um, to walk with us in our struggle, to support us during the journey of building the game, to support us financially as, as well as, um, you know, in, uh, integrating into the industry and, and everything that happened there. Um, and so I think for me, what, I, what I've learned from grief and what I've learned from mourning is that for every time there's a season, right? Like, or for every season, there's a, there's, there's a time to like grieve and, um, and, and a time to, to move on. And I think that like those moments for me have changed throughout this whole experience. Um, when Joel was alive and when I was processing my grief and when I was making art in honor of him and when I was the journalist of my life, um, there was nothing else I could do. Um, and so it became like this internal like compulsion for me to create, right? Because it was the thing I could do in the face of circumstances that were beyond my control. Whose idea, and, whose idea was it and how did you tell, how did you tell the other people in your family and your and your wife yeah my wife and i are creatives and so right from the very first day that joel was diagnosed i, I remember amy was writing and i was making art um and we were sharing it with the people around us that's how we process that's how we share wow. and so over those years i mean we amy and i made we made a short film that nobody's going to see. Um, <laughs> we made a, a children's book. Uh, we made um, yeah, uh, art and blog posts, all I'm of a, that stuff. So I, I, I said, you need to NFT them out because I'm a fan. So there we go. Yeah. No, I mean, and, um, I'd take, certainly love to talk game, about that stuff later take too. It but, game yeah. for a second. I, I do want to say yeah. that um, I've, um, I've played the game. And I played it when I was in Sheffield uh, in mm. a documentary festival. I don't think you were there. No. But, uh, that Dragon Cancer was in the same uh, category as Clouds Over Cedra, my mm. first uh, VR doc. Um, and I was very curious because they had put a game with a piece <laughs> film yeah. and then also had put a website called like do not track was an also yeah. an incredible project that really like is, is a profit of everything that's happening now with privacy. It was first a yeah. web doc that is just phenomenal. Um, I think maybe hollow was there by Elaine Sheldon, you know, like mm -hmm. the, it was like this transmedia is getting VRized was happening, you know, this yeah. little moment. And I played that dragon cancer and I was like, it, I, I think it's that moment where, um, you know, the Beach Boys make pet sounds, but then they, <laughs> they listen to, you know, Sergeant Pepper and they're like, oh, wait a minute. There is like depth here. You know, there's mm. so much. It was it's such an exquisite um, piece of work and I recommend it to, to everyone. But, you know, there's going to be a lot of people who have an aversion to playing a game like this. Yeah. And, and, and I think that to me was very interesting because who wants to play a game about this once you know what it's about, right? right? But wildly, when you do, um, you don't regret it at all. You mm -hmm. feel transformed. You mm -hmm. look at things very differently. I have an enormous amount of empathy 
um, for you and what you went through. And I didn't even know you. Mm-hmm. And I got to know you when we met in New Zealand for the first time in person. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, um, yeah, I mean, it was electric, right? Because in some mm-hmm. way, we had shared something in such a unique and intimate way. And that's kind right. of what I am curious how I make people come back. I would make people, someone come back why they should do this. I feel it reinvents a form. It thinks about mm. what, it, it really could only have been the game, right? It really was, it was very hard for you to pick any other medium. You pick the medium. And I wanted to know how you deal with people who have an aversion to this, but also why did you pick video games as a, as a medium to tell the story? Well, there's kind of two ways that I'd like to approach that. One is just that when we think of video games, we think of uh, them in terms of fun, right? An activity of playing a game. Um, but what I, when I think of video games, I think of worlds to be present inside of, right? And if I were to create a world to introduce you to my son, you know, and I, and I created a garden and I invited you into that garden and I said, hey, walk with me a little while. I'm going to tell you about my son. I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, allow you to push him on a swing. I'm going to, to replay the echoes of our conversations and the echoes of his laughter. I want to tell you how he changed me. Um, I want to show you how um, loving him can change you too. To me, the, the thing that marks that kind of experience is the same is intimacy. And that's the same. It's not empathy. It's, it's, it's intimacy. It's compassion. It's not trying to understand how somebody else feels. It's about walking in compassion alongside somebody. That means to suffer with them. And so this act of creating a little world, a little garden, inviting you into it, allowed you to walk with compassion with me. Um, and that's what I think felt so special. And it's something that we discovered early on. Early on, this was going to be an art project, like strictly like hang it on a wall, interactive art. But as soon as we started to put the, the, the player into, the, into that hospital room with me and, and reflect as they sat with me in that room and recounted these memories that, you know, are kind of out time, outside of time and space, they're, they're common, you know, they're specific to me, but they're universal. Um, I think people allowed themselves to be transferred into that, into those moments. And yeah. I think that really, that really drew people closer to us. You know, I, th- I think it's, I always, you know, my, my work has to deal with evoking uh, empathy also. Mm-hmm. And I always feel the way, the reason these sort of interactive mediums like games like VR, like AR, like a lot of these things, they have, they're more, they're more, they give you more agency, but they can also make you more vulnerable. Right. And I think it is that combination of, um, that with the agency comes, yeah, kind of different responsibility. Um, yeah. Right. In the, in the story with your attention, it becomes very evident if you're not paying attention. Um, yeah. This doesn't, it requires more presence, right? And, yeah. it, and then once you have a designer that meets you halfway, you're willing to give of yourself in a way with all your senses, your consciousness, in a way, and even video games that are 2D that I've played are very, very immersive. I've played mm-hmm. Grand Theft Auto uh, and, and 10 hours have gone by and I'm, I'm still um, mm-hmm. on the top floor of some, you know, crazy place that I started out at and I get all bleary eyed and, but I feel like it did something to me, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't know if necessarily for the best, you know, but sure. in some ways I knew it was a medium to be reckoned with a medium that obviously is the biggest threat to Hollywood, you know, um, you know, Hollywood is their games now that make more money. Than sure. Yeah. It, it's like an industry of, of such epic proportions of wealth spent on making games. Incredible. Um, but I think the, they generally veered towards this very, this formula of, 
I, I guess the the more more um, more related to sex and violence. I guess sure a lot of how I would describe it. But I have this. I have this, and this is something I want to ask you. You know, is is it is it something that we should allow to have these spaces not be controlled because oh. <laughs> it's a way for people to indulge in a kind of fantasy also that maybe we shouldn't be reacting against that because there could be a worse thing that could happen if we sure. kind of control that. But maybe we should be doing a little bit more of what you're doing is just give people another option, you know? Like, I'm curious sure. of whether you think yourself, what you think of the dominant way. Like we, I mean, as filmmakers, hmm. we have to deal with cheesy Hollywood and Marvel and all of that stuff. And I, I ignore it, but I also realize like, it's just a phenomenon, but there is so much support for filmmakers to be creative and independent in the past 20, 30 yeah. years. I'm curious in games, if that is nascent or what is the indie game community like? Well, okay, so with any new technology, right? Humanity figures out a way to express their vice through it, right? So we think about like the rise of film and certainly digital film and how like pornography and violence have been kind of like intrinsic to all of it, right? And in many ways, like even driving it financially. Um, I think that there is something to humanity wanting to express their vices, uh, those, inner, those inner urges, right? And I think that video games are no different. Um, but I think, you know, whether or not you think that should be controlled, whether or not you think that should be, um, like, uh, regulated or things like that, um, kind of depend on, on the way you, your philosophy about, about how to build a good society, right? And I think that at the most intrinsic level, the thing that I believe is that, that video games aren't just another form of entertainment. They're another place of, um, of, of presence. And the question that I have to people is, am I the same person in my physical space as I am in this digital space with you, as I am in this escapist place in the virtual world, as I am on the internet, right? Or and there are various- Real spaces. Yeah, and the question is, are those real spaces? And I would submit that they are real spaces. Um, and what we've done is that we've you could, never inter kill, you could never kill in a video game space. Well, but see, that, that's the thing I can, because what, and I think you have to look at video games as, as what they are. They are a mechanic with a story on top of them. So I point something at the screen and I like, let's take a first person shooter. For example, a first person shooter is a game in which you are, you have a point of view that's of you, uh, like me looking out of my eyes, I'm looking into the, into the virtual world. I have a gun, I'm pointing it at an object and I'm shooting it. Um, and the skill comes in being able to do that efficiently and effectively, right? Um, but that game could very easily just be slingshots. It could be throwing stones. It could be throwing bunnies, you know? Like it, 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 the story of what you're doing um, is, is what's being expressed, but the mechanic of it is, is a common activity. And, and so I think we have to, to think about like, when we're playing a game, we are all agreeing that we're in a virtual space and we're agreeing to the rules. It's a magic circle of rules that we're all agreeing to, and we're going to have fun or not. And if people obey the rules and we have fun together, then that's great. When people start breaking the rules, it starts to disintegrate. And so I think we have to think about uh, these circles of agreed upon play, you know, when we're on the internet, when we're in our, our private spaces, when we're interacting with people in these video games, um, what is that common language of decency? And what is that common language of, of philosophy of what is good? I think those are the questions that need to be asked. And I, I think that we're doing a disservice by keeping those worlds separate. I think we allow certain things to kind of fester um, I, I think, you know, because I think the danger is um, because people ask me, you know, a lot with, with virtual reality um, and, you know, I, there, it's quite obvious that, you know, bad things um, happen when mm -hmm. you have something that has, um, you know, when you have more freedom around it 
and more people can do it. I, I actually think as a form of expression, um, video games are very interesting or very cinematic. Um, I don't necessarily play a lot now, um, mm -hmm. but I grew up playing uh, games. And this is where I wanted to take a little brief and do a little video game nostalgia, you know? <laughs> I think it's a good little break uh, for people to, to know what their first video game experiences were like as children. Because I do think there's something about this medium that you connect with as a child and sure. that you don't as you much with maybe other mediums, you know? Mm -hmm. It's the child's first medium, right? And I think there is this sort of thing of, do I grow, should I be growing out of this, you know? And I think in some ways we're realizing that we don't need to um, if we yeah. have, you know, if we have the right types of ways and it's okay for those other things to really be exciting because they, they are exciting. My first game was Pong and it was Atari and it was, you know, basically two bars and a kind of, you just played like paddle ball on like a really 16 digit type of screen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had it rigged to my, parents wooden laminated floor tv you know because this was i think the early 80s and then i jigged it up to the back and i played it in my living room and my parents um thought i they thought it was a computer you know yeah. because they were it looked like a computer and my dad you know was an engineer and there was something about it that related to engineering and and all that stuff. Really, I was just playing a game and they really encouraged it, you know, which is a really weird, fun fact. That's awesome. You know, there are some people in the beginning who didn't see it in the way it's seen as now, you know? It was so new, it wasn't apparent that it was going to be that addictive or anything like that. But we grew up with that. What was yours? What are some of Oh, your man. Uh, for me, uh, it, was, it was going over to a friend's house to ask if I could play their Nintendo. Like that was a lot of my childhood. Finally, I managed which to. Which what's that? Which Nintendo? The NES, the first, the first Nintendo in the states. Yeah, and the then cartridge, and you put it down. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I love it. Yeah, that. and and we couldn't like my my parents were averse to you know video games and and technology to a large part, but I was always just fascinated and drawn into technology. I remember, you know, I got my Game Boy when I was. Uh, eight for my birthday and there was no taking it back then because I you know I got it for my birthday so um it was kind of always at my side um and I think it led to just like a lifelong fascination with computers you know like even in fourth grade I remember I was I was programming on the local apple computers on the, at, the, at the school I was doing independent studies like to me it was always I'm just like a gateway there because yeah like, back then especially when they you realize that this is what computers were being used for, you know? And, yeah. and it's like, I found it to be very fascinating that when I started getting more in, into VR, I had to use something called a game engine, you know, whether yeah. it's VR and real. And I was like, wait a minute, this is weird. You know, these are meant for games. I'm trying to tell stories. Like, right. what is this telling me? Like, yeah. Is this a game? You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, and maybe we've done it a disservice by calling it video games, right? Like to yeah. me, video games just represent electronic uh, images on a screen that are interactive, right? And so like, to me, it's a medium. It's a, it's a place in which you play games, but that's not the only thing you do. And we've certainly found that you can build entire social networks and, and industries and economies and worlds within, within these metaverses, these, these virtual spaces. So like a game is just one thing that we do uh, within these spaces. And I think that like we are like our generation, 40-ish, uh, right? Is probably the last non-digital natives. <laughs> like, like everybody after us was like born into the internet and they had a, a they had a, a native How they do tongue, I don't you know, know, and they see it differently than us. Yeah. So I, that, I think that is, it's that is true. I'm starting to feel old now because, <laughs> because I, I do say, I do think about, I do meet people who've never not known or, or think the internet is Instagram, 
you know, mm. the internet is social media. And I'm like, no, my dear friends, <laughs> the, the, the mission of this, like I was there at the beginning in the nineties. It's not the beginning, but you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. Trying to like, remember when there were no search engines and you'd have to go into www and you'd have to like pick some weird word and yeah. just let it hit. And yeah. that was your search engine, like you were trying URL names, you know? Um, yeah. But let's take a pause because I think we're at 30 minutes and I think this is a great time for a trailer for the game. Okay. I'll bring that up here. Bittersweet was a daily affection. Um, do you know how they celebrate off treatment day, like when kids are done with their treatments? I, I guess maybe you don't because you're not in the clinic as much as I am, but on someone's last day, they always bring them a cake and they sing happy off therapy day to you. I'm sorry, guys. It's not good. he thinks we should move forward with the radiation and it it kind of freaks me out but it could be another miracle there's a story in the bible where jesus and his disciples are on a boat and a furious storm hits the sea and everyone thinks they're gonna die and where do you think jesus is he's asleep in the back of the boat seen that in a while <laughs> and it gets me it strikes me different every time of course yeah it's very beautiful you should be very proud incredible like it's just uh, you know really something um you know it reminded me in there because when we first met i didn't know about the role that religion plays in your life. Mm. And, and it, it was, you know, I'm, I'm um, from New York, um, kind of, let's say, you know, I grew up in a religious family, but it was more Eastern religions. So it was a little bit different than um, Christianity in America, you know? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it, from my understanding, um, that's what they tell me, a dominant religion. That yeah, yeah. Something like 80% of Americans identify as Christian, um, which, to be honest, where I hang out, it feels like I don't meet many religious people in mm. the cities as much. And, um, and there's a very secular culture in general that I think there's a, there's a bit of a divide in the country, I'm sure. It's kind of about red states and blue states, but there is something about religion 
and people who are rural and religious. And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I was always fascinated by this sort of, this what you brought into, because I was meeting you at film festivals where it wasn't necessarily the, the background of a lot of the other people, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, they were more urban, they were more cosmopolitan, they were very, very, uh, you know, didn't have that sort of background. I remember talking to you about it and just being so fascinated uh, and me thinking, you know, this is the kind of conversations we need to have, you right. know, and, and I don't get to have them. How has it been for you, you know, in these in these spaces? Have you felt like an outsider? Did you feel like hard to figure out how that works or it was not my issue? Well, you know, I, I read something recently. I haven't studied Marx, right? But um, I was actually warned heavily against Marx growing up. Um, <laughs> but uh, one, one comment that stuck out to me recently was I was reading about religion being the opiate of the masses, right? Um, but he goes on to further talk about how um, there's this sense of like how the world should be and that it's not. Right. And, and in one function, religion has been used to say, like, um, just make peace with the fact that it's out of your control and it's going to be bad. Right. And then there's another force, you know, exercised in different ways in our philosophies of like, no, that's not right. Like, it should be this way and we're going to make it that way. Right. And I think that there's this this internal struggle, right, between like how the, 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 this idea that the world in existence is not as it should be, um, and that we have a hope for, for something that will be better. Um, and so the reason I bring that up is because in a strange way, um, our family coming forward with being in the middle of something that one, we couldn't control, and two, that everybody would agree, it's just not right right? Was this common place of vulnerability where like there is no dispute, right? Like there is no bickering over theology and philosophy and things like that. It's this shared knowing yeah. of, of, of truth and beauty in, in that regard. And so what amazed me, because I was conditioned, you know, uh, um, American evangelical right, what warned against that the society would hate me for what I believed and, and what, I, what I loved, right? But what I found is that they, even more than the church, welcomed me. Because especially in the video game industry, you know, this is a space, like we've talked about, is a space full of vice, right? But it's also full of people that were told that the things that they love, the things that matter to them, um, were not good. They were immoral, maybe even of the devil, right? Mm-hmm. And so there's this... Um, there was already this stratification that had happened. And so when we came with our pain saying, we value this space, we value what you value. Um, and we're sharing our pain in this shared context. They were like, come on in, like, here's a seat at the table. Tell me about it. And we didn't have to, we weren't coy about what we believed. We're just like, Hey, we want to let you know that we're Christians and, and our son has cancer and he's alive now, and then eventually that he died. And so we were always very upfront about that. Like we were people of faith and we went through something horribly terrible that nobody should have to go through. And, uh, and so I, I guess in, you know, in, in short, like people welcomed us. And I think coming, like I was conditioned that art was the thing by which we advance truth, right? And this process became this, this journey of like, I thought I had all of the answers in a tidy little bow and I don't, and I'm left with questions. Is it good? The question I had, is it good for me as an artist to ask questions and not have the answers? And that's been this journey into just like the world of, of entertainment and the world of art and fine art and all of this stuff is being comfortable with the questions and being willing to have like honest conversations with people about those answers. The thing is, uh, you know, I, um, we talk a lot about um, about diversity, and I think there are many ways at, at, at looking at it. And I, I felt the best way, whether it's video games or whether it's VR, you know, it's what we try to do even at ISET, is we, if you get different types of people making things, mm-hmm. you know, um, and just seeing themselves as a creator, um, I think, um, 
This is actually fascinating because now that we said creator within a religious context, you know, (laughs) very interesting. But but I think it really was where I said, this is the type of way, this will bridge the political divide. Like if we allow these types of spaces that happened, that allowed me to meet someone like you and to, um, of course, share in your grief, but also share in your talent of of the artistry, the aesthetics, Mm -hmm. you know. Like it's a, like as a, as a creator myself, I look at your work and I can see how, how well crafted it is, Mm. how beautiful it is, you know, and how it was, you know, it has to be so well thought out, you know, you'd have to have so much patience to, to do something like this and also courage, you know, because it is a topic that if it doesn't work well, um, is a sensitive topic. You know, so I, I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I, I really do think what, what, what I think is an added dimension to this is that it led to that, you know, us getting to know each other and, and for you to, to be in the different environments and, you know, made me think of the sixties and seventies when, you know, I felt like people in urban cosmopolitan spaces, like in the Northeast, would go down to the South to register voters. And mm. There's more of a, an engagement uh, in caring about, you know, the, the, the future of the country. And I think now if that's in virtual spaces and look at, look at what's already happened in yeah. virtual spaces of social media is the thing, mm-hmm. there is a stronger segregation. There is a right. more angry, right. uh, more stereotyped sort of ways of looking at it. You know, I, I, oh, yeah. I, I don't feel I don't feel like that's very healthy for us because in some ways there's no way I could have had that conversation um, um, on on social media, but through a game and through sharing and through the spaces that supported the game, Mm -hmm. uh, your work, I think it was, you know, it was a revelation. And that's what, you know, is really important to realize too, is that, the diversity of viewpoints and worldviews should we should think about it in a very holistic way, but also, you know, yeah. empower other people to create. Because I think yeah. because you created it, like you you automatically then like much respect forever. You know, yeah. like, you took a chance, and I yeah. think that's what for a lot of people on this webinar. You know, I want them to realize that it, it it's not easy, um, but once you do it. Um, you really do join an incredible community of people, you yeah. know, to learn from. I mean, I've learned yeah. so much from you. And I think so much of that sort of thing is that's when things grow and get better. Yeah. Um, well, well, and I, I was just going to, I was going to add to that. I think that like one of the issues is that we've been optimizing for the wrong thing. You know, the things like social dilemma documentary on Netflix and, and our, the rise of privacy and all these different things, like we're seeing, like we've optimized for attention. We've optimized for uh, for money, and so we're creating certain types of spaces and certain types of cultures. Where if I want your eyes, then I have to play to your vices. I have to play to your biases. Like that's how I get your attention. Um, and this was a much different space because I was like in the mix, sharing uh, this story on the floor of of enthusiast conventions where everybody's dressed like their favorite anime character. And I'm sitting here saying like, here's my son. Can I tell you about him for a little bit? And, and the shift for people, um, uh, like for one, the, 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 the fact that people stopped for one was amazing. The step, the, the, the fact that they sat down and engaged with us was, was astonishing. And then when they get up, got up transformed and they're giving me hugs, I'm a stranger and we're in the middle of a hundred thousand people on a convention floor and they're exchanging the intimacy that I, I exchange with them. They want to repay it back. Right. And so they're sharing their stories too. And so we just found that it was a really like um, a safe space to do that. But what I noticed was that I, as a creator in this medium, this video game medium, it's not just a broadcast medium. I'm not just shouting my beliefs over the air. I have to invite these people to take the next step. They have to continue to play. And I remember there were moments where somebody would stand up from the chair and say, I, I'm sorry, I, I have to stop because I, I don't pray. And I had, you know, we had put something press X to pray. Now it was me that was praying, 
right? But like for them, it was like that bridge too far. And so I think when we start to integrate ourselves, digital natives see themselves the same way offline as they do online. And, and so we have to consider that these people are bringing themselves and their beliefs into the things that they play and engage with. And if we, if we ask them to do stuff that are against what they believe at the core of their being, then we're, we're being, we have the potential to abuse them. And so it's that, it's that change in tone that, that as a creator, people have to be willing to listen to me. I just can't shout at them. I think if we, if we take that position, it will create a different type of media landscape. Lovely. Why don't we go to this trailer for this doc? Oh, sure. Um, are there any questions? And I have some questions that if we have a little more time, we can go through. Okay. Mr. and Mrs. Green, I'm sorry. It's not good news. People play games to escape. Working on a game about my son who's terminally ill, it's hard for them to wrap their head around what it is that we're doing. Yeah. I wanted to create a space for me to talk about my son. Unlike a movie or a book where you have to have these moments that all string together, we can just say, here's a moment. It's like these little glimpses into our life. Yay, yeah. <laughs> People ask, well, isn't it kind of strange showing a game about terminal cancer? I'm thinking, why is that so strange? Why are we all walking around anonymous and not talking about the things that shape the way we are? I can get so busy doing this game for Joel that, you're not that I'm not playing with Joel. I feel this compulsion to just share it, to talk about it, to capture it, because as soon as it's gone, it will be a shadow and I won't be able to remember it. I think there's so much that I don't know because we're doing something that people just don't do. That's the big experiment. Push the boundaries a little bit to say, what, what can you experience emotionally in a video game? How can you connect? The things that happen to us define us. They make us who we are. They're complex, they're nuanced, they're, they're tragic and they're beautiful. can't escape forever. I'm speechless. I don't want to talk anymore. <laughs> Moment of silence, please. Amazing stuff. Um, why don't we just stop there um, and see if there's any questions? I think give us a moment to pause. Oh, there's a question. Whoa. Okay. We have. Um, question, and we'll answer it live. Um, are things in your life, are there things in your life now that you feel compelled to process via making a game? There are two parts. The most immediate is what we're working on now. And that is, um, um, is a focus, part of our studio is focusing on accessibility. It's this idea that um, when we, um, that there are, there are stories that need to be told and there is a 
creativity that needs to be expressed among the people who are most underserved in our, in our culture um, and in our industry. And one of those things is those who are profoundly disabled, right? Um, and that might come in the form of physical disability or otherwise. Um, we were invited uh, to work on a project um, that allows us to serve children with spinal muscular atrophy. And that's a sort of disease that caused motor neuron death. And so many of these children die in childhood. Many of these children are wheelchair users um, who are often on trachs uh, and use devices like eye tracking software and switches, large round switches to be able to interact with uh, computers. And so um, I used compute digital art in the digital landscape to express the things that changed me and, and what I believed. I would love if our games that we're making now, we're making a one button game where all you need is to be able to hit a switch to be able to play. We're making a game that we hope will be a gateway to a digital livelihood for these children. Um, and it doesn't even have to be a livelihood, just like a canvas to paint on if you will, a place to express their creativity and their thoughts, a place to leave their mark on the world. Um, and I feel like digital spaces are uniquely fitted to be able to do that because we can consider them right from the inception of, of this arc, world architecture that we're creating. So much of our, our culture and our life is about like um, adding on to existing architectures and existing frameworks and trying to make something that that didn't consider them in the first place accessible to them. I feel like in the, in the digital landscape, we can create entire worlds that were specially fitted and designed with them in mind and will allow um, these kids to flourish in a creative way. So my hope is that the work that we do empowers others to share, um, to share their digital and their personal life through these means. And the future of video games for me is that um, games are the things that we play to connect with each other, right? But they're just the beginning of a lifelong journey, uh, you know, of, of change that happens to us. And so like, if we can introduce them to these tools now, there are creative tools in these massive digital worlds with creative tools for players where people will be able to tell their stories in new and, and really fascinating ways. So that's that's one area where I hope that you know, our work is helping set the stage for future creators. Great. Um, I have another question here. Um, how do you view the impact of the increasing prevalence of VR technology mm. and the affordability of this technology on a societal scale? Does the medium offer transformation? It's... <laughs> <for your sellers? laughs> or it's incredible. Or impacts likely to be more subtle? And I, I'm curious what... Uh, the Im what you mean by impact? I mean, yeah. It's it's transformative. I remember the first uh, first experience I had in VR. I think was in a conference at a hotel room, and I just was put inside this headset, and I was in a cocoon of sorts, and I started to like put my hands on the wall, and suddenly like certain pieces came loose, and uh, and I started poking, and they would start to flow with zero gravity, and the the cocoon made way to this this intergalactic landscape that was like a beautiful sunset, um, but it was in, it was in a, a virtual space. And it was, a, it was a project called Irrational Exuberance, I believe it's called, um, by an artist out of um, uh, LA. Buffalo Vision is the studio. Um, and, and to me, it was that moment that I was like, oh, okay. Like this is, this is an alternate dimension. This is a parallel reality. This is, um, a place where I can be myself and be exposed to this, these numinous spaces of, of, of um, spaces that create awe and wonder. And that invite me into um, a place to, to relate to people in a different way. And I think that the, it's, it's vital that we see ourselves in a physical space, the same way we see ourselves in the virtual space when it comes to these virtual space, like these virtual realities, because we are reaching with our hands. We are experiencing memories. You know, our vision, you know, our senses are how we take in our memories. Right. And so they are replacing our senses. 
um, and we're creating memories, we're creating new behavioral pathways, we're, we're creating like, um, we're interacting with people. And so things like harassment and personal space and like, and, and you know, these crimes that can be committed in, in virtual space suddenly aren't, aren't fake anymore. They have to be, we have to address uh, uh, harassment, ableism and sexism and accessibility and, and all of that. It's an opportunity for us in creating a virtual space to reconsider the kind of the type of humanity we want to be, um, and I think that's what I, I think it's that we're on the just we're playing games and we're playing to our vices. That's what we're doing right now, and I find that kind of boring. Like I, it's it's fun, you know, but um, for it to to be worth our time and investing our our souls and our are relationships they, are into. They worse than fun? Can you, would you say video games could be evil? And if so, how? It, it, it just depends on how you see uh, transgression happening. Can transgression only happen in your mind? Or do you actually have to do it with your body uh, for you to be guilty of something, right? And, and if we're um, with our virtual hands committing sexual violence in these games that allow us to do so, like what's the difference between that and and passively watching it on internet browsers or 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 performing it in, in real life? You know, Where does that horizon close? You know. Well, I think consent, of course, of how, sure. um, like what you're what you're engaging in in that experience. I think there are always these warning labels on, on games. I think now of yeah. you know, have ratings and they have all that. Yeah, it, it is. Um, I, I agree with you. I think there is. It, I guess the idea is, you know, as humans, do we need a space where um, we can feel, we can explore uh, a lot of our dark side too, right? And a mm -hmm. lot of, a lot of, um, you know, people always talk about the Godfather uh, movie, mm -hmm. one of the best movies. It's actually, you know, it's a glorification of a, of a very, very bad person. You yeah. Know? In some ways, you know, it's, um, it's that, that idea is very pervasive in our yeah. society as a result of kind of picking, making you empathize with a slight or a very strong antihero is something that I think um, has deep consequences for our political culture. Yeah, <laughs> you know, if you actually want to want to get to the root of it, there there is something that has commingled with Hollywood and 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 politics, starting with yeah. Reagan, of course. You know, and you know, and then it's just there's a deluge now of 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 this idea of, you know, the charismatic leader in, in some ways, you know? Yeah. Um, so, um, and then, you know, it really shows how even cinema was used in Nazi Germany, you know, to propel right. uh, Hitler's myth. You know, these are very, very, very powerful things that have yes. shaped the world, you know? Yes. And I don't, I don't know if we can neuter the power of, of video games, um, by policing it, I just feel we need to broaden the possibilities. I don't, I think it's a losing game yeah. to try to get rid of um, a world where none of that exists. I mean, right. I, it has to obviously be persecuted and we have to fight the, the good fight, but I don't think there's a world where we can be rid of it. And I, I feel, that having things go out from the open too much, um, you know, the, the deplatforming that's just mm. generally happening. It, it's just troublesome that someone, mm. there is an authority, you know, these are philosophical problems of who decides these codes and why. And if you sure. are, it is inevitably a corrupting choice. Or if most people decide in a democratic way, we forget that democracies can also be uh, illiberal, right? They can go against minorities, and you know, you know, India is a, a case in point in in some ways that has been more is a very very democratic place. Um, there's no stolen elections happening, uh, yet it's still 
very pernicious to certain groups um, that are, you know, and, and this is John Stuart Mill who wrote about this, you know, mm. the reason a country like Pakistan exists because they didn't feel like they would have a role in India being a minority. Mm. That in some mm. way, the whole concept. And I think with video games, like it's just going to be hard to kind of shape it. But what, what I, I know what you mean, it still doesn't mean we can't critique it, but I think your work um, and the work of many other um, people is, and especially as it merges with VR, uh, I think it's very fascinating because now we're all playing in the same sandbox, you know? Yeah. That's kind of what's interesting, that filmmakers are playing with game designers. Um, yes. And these worlds are meeting for the first time in, yeah. in a way where we're creating a new meaning and, and magic out of it. And that's what yeah. I like. I mean, my, my, I did, a, I did a, an experience called Zikr. If you want to talk about, you know, we we're talking about transformation. It's about, you know, uh, the mystical part of Islamic practice called Sufism. Huh. And uh -huh. basically, you can only do it if you do it with three other people and it's gameplay together in the same space, but wearing a headset and kind yeah. of doing rituals and dancing together. Is it like and a trance? It evokes a trance state or yeah, it evokes a, trance a flow state? state. Yeah. Yeah, flow state. yeah. But you have to like kind of do it with other people. Yeah. Their avatars in there. And it's meant to also work remotely. We haven't set that version up yet, but as an installation, you just see people in headsets like dancing together. Like it's just the most amazing. It's the most amazing thing, and they wouldn't. That's amazing. If they weren't wearing it, and I realized the. Um, I realized like, wow, the, the we can manipulate people in ways that yeah. are just yeah. unbelievably complex. Now, these people would not be dancing, you know, yeah. like they are dancing, and it is incredible that, and they are praying to Allah, you know, mm. like there, there, there was we did this at Sundance. There are people who said, if that's Islam, sign me up. You know, Interesting. You know, wow. And I was like, yes, you should sign up. It's very nice. You know, don't be afraid of it. Yeah. Like <laughs> I, <laughs> I've asked this question before people. I was talking to uh, one of the, the founders of Magic they, they did like the mixed reality and virtual reality. And I, my question to him was like, where's the priesthood in all of this? And and I don't mean that in a purely religious term. I don't mean it as somebody dictating what's good or bad or, or somebody dictating like you know, who's, who's saved and who's damned. Like, it's not about that. It's about like, how do we care for people within these virtual spaces? Who's, who, where are the philosophers? Where are the policy makers? Where are the, the political thinkers? And the, the um, yeah, well, I hope, because that's, that's, what, that's what I hope, you know, is that we're going to find in a program like you have at Johns Hopkins is like, is, is future, um, uh, you know, future world leaders and, and future diplomats and, and, and politicians and artists and thinkers, because going back before, I feel like we've been optimizing for the wrong thing. We've been optimizing for attention. We've been optimizing for escape. We've been optimizing for systematic play that leans more towards um, like just very utilitarian purposes rather than just like, where are the humanities? Where are the poets? You know, and like when we bring the filmmakers and the poets and the and the and the playwrights and the philosophers and the and the political thinkers and the economists into this space and ask, what if, what if the world was formed in a different way? What could we create here? Um, that's Jobs. where the power is. You yeah. know, it's Steve Jobs that basically. I mean, it's cliche. You know, he yeah. brought in um, basic Zen thinking with industrial design, but like just just a, a little bit, you know, yeah. and it radically like, you know, it, it's the liberal arts when merged with technology that make the heart sing, you know? Yes. And, yes. and I think that's what is so hard to explain to people sometimes, you know, who um, are the skeptics or everything. I was like, no, the arts and sciences have been divided for too long. Right. right? They dance they together. They're supposed to be together. Yeah, it's called the College of Arts and Science. <laughs> you know, don't forget the arts, you know, and you can't measure everything, you know, like some things, you know, you just gotta, you gotta, you gotta go with it. It's creative, and we can't have those same efficiency um, models of, um, you know, of the kind of late capitalism we're in. But we can go on forever. 
the other questions are more related to um, the game specifically. And I think we can um, maybe just take a couple and just maybe sure. yeah. if you can just let's try to, you know, maybe make it quick. Um, someone said in the game, we saw what elements of user activity like player choices did you select to use? One of the things that was really important to us is that people didn't feel like they could make a wrong choice and hurt Joel, right? Like this is about like, you know, we're in a world where we want to do the right thing, but the level is broken. And so a lot of times the, the emotional landscape that we painted was with the lack of choice, um, was the restriction of choice that mirrored our own lives. Um, and so rather than focusing on choice and agency in our game, we were focusing on presence, poetry in our game, um, and, and, and expressing how things felt and asking you to sit in that space with us. Great. Um, I think that's I think that's pretty good. I'm just really honored to have you part of the ISET faculty. Really excited you're going to be teaching this course called The Future of Cinematic Gaming. Um, for those of you who can take it, I highly, highly recommend it. It's going to be incredible. And we're going to make stuff. Yes. We're going to yeah. tell our own stories. So yeah. I think that's what's going to be great. Even if you're not a programmer, right? Like we want it to be a place where all the humanities can come yeah. in and yes. express themselves. Inclusive in that way. Um, okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining.